Good morning. And I have to tell you, I'm Carla Hayden with the Library of Congress, and I am truly excited to welcome you back in person to the Library of Congress to celebrate the opening of a magnificent exhibit, Not an Ostrich and Other Images from America's Library. And part of this excitement has to do with the fact that this is our first new exhibit in two years. And so to be able to focus on the library's rich photography collection is a special honor for me because the Library of Congress is home to more than 173 million items. More than 15 million of those are photographs. And nearly one million photographs were considered for this exhibition and the final 400, sounds like the, in the March Madness, the final four, <laughs> the final 400 carefully curated photographs that were chosen to really take you through a journey through America's history from the beautiful, the heartening to some disturbing and even humorous. And it spans three centuries telling America's story through stunning photographs. It's also gonna tell the story of photography itself all the way to today's digital images. Now there's so many photographs and I'm looking right at Seabiscuit <laughs> that will draw you in or take your breath away. And picking a favorite is almost impossible. Whether it's the portraits of Abraham Lincoln Elizabeth Taylor, John F. Kennedy, the iconic photo of the migrant mother, and also American Gothic by Gordon Parks, images of the Wright brothers' first flight in 1903, a newly discovered photograph of Harriet Tubman, or to the photograph that inspired the exhibition, Not an Ostrich. I did think it was an ostrich at first. <laughs> so, this is also the first time the Library of Congress has featured an exhibition that captures the breadth of its photography holdings, and it's truly spectacular. So we hope that visitors will explore the rich and diverse photography collections at the Library of Congress and encounter images that are both moving, amusing, familiar, and unexpected. And what's so special about this exhibition is that it draws from a variety of subjects and time periods. There's more than meets the eye in the National Library's enormous collection of photographs. So, this exhibition would not have been possible though without the support and generosity of the Annenberg Space for Photography, the Annenberg Foundation, and Wallace Annenberg herself. This is a shining example of how the public and the private sectors can work together to create an enduring record of American life. We are also very proud that visitors can take a piece of the library's photography collection home with them in print or use these pictures online. The library has published a new photo zine to accompany the exhibition. It's full of pictures with the fascinating stories and it is available in the library shop and online. In addition, photography fans anywhere can engage with our photography collections online. Many collections of photographs have already been digitized and are available at our website, loc.gov pictures. And this is a wonderful resource for teachers, students, scholars, and creators around the world. You may know that the Library of Congress is a treasure trove of America's heritage. We preserve, collect, and inspire because history never stops. And we're here to make sure that it's conserved for generations to come. So now it is my pleasure to welcome the person who has the great job of overseeing all of these magnificent photographs. Please welcome the Chief of the Library of Congress Prints and Photographs Division, Helena Zinkum. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for turning out early and starting the week with something bright and delightful. I'd actually like to welcome you to a homecoming. 
this wonderful photography exhibition. Wallace Annenberg was inspired to sponsor this show when she heard photographer Carol Highsmith speak on the CBS Sunday morning program. So all of you in the media uh, take pride in having had a role in triggering your services helped spread the word and Wallace Annenberg was listening. Now Carol, who is here today, and you'll hear from her shortly, she spoke, as did the librarian, about how the library's historical images have stimulated Carol's own work for more than 40 years in documenting America state by state. Mrs. Annenberg so liked this introduction to the tip of our iceberg, the library's collections, as you've heard, of more than 15 million photos, that she wanted to shine a bright light on us, especially on the unexpected and rarely seen images as well as the icons. And fully 25% of the pictures in the show, they had never been digitized before. So there's new to be seen. The renowned exhibition curator, Ann Wilkes Tucker, dived in for a two-year immersion. She looked at the one and a half million images digitized online and then came into our reading room. My colleagues in the prints and photographs division, including Beverly Brannon, our curator of photography, uh, we brought her boxes and then more boxes and more boxes. She thinks she looked at at least 10,000 in person and as you heard, there was a filtering or a funneling uh, until 3,000 images were eventually narrowed to this 400 powerful photos. I mean, just look around you. Most of these pictures would stop you in their tracks, wouldn't you? Wouldn't they stop you in your tracks? They'd make you look twice or at least raise a quick smile. Some will make you frown and feel sad. But before the, the, library, it, the library opened this exhibit first in 2018 at the Annenberg Space for Photography in Los Angeles. Now, Ann Tucker, she lives in Houston. So she's not here with us today, but she'd love to talk with any of you by telephone and Brett Zonker can help make that arrangement. All right, the photographs have come back home here in the Jefferson Building, filling the walls of our great curtain gallery. They are displayed as reproductions. I've been asked about that, but I think it's actually a really important aspect of the show. Come to our reading room and see the original artifacts. The purpose of this show is to be able to reveal 400. Again, maybe it's only a small portion out of 15 million, but the other important part is the pictures are big. You're going to notice details that you just wouldn't see in a book, or maybe even without a magnifying glass in person. And you'll also notice that there are monitors throughout the show where it's like slide carousels. They'll move quickly by you. There are more than 165 photographers represented, talented women, African American, Hispanic, and Native American image makers included. The 70 photos printed in the very large sizes, uh, some as huge as the windows, so thank you Cheryl Regan for that treat. Cheryl is our exhibit uh, coordinator, director, producer, designer. <laughs> And I hope you'll feel that the space is so inviting. I was talking with Dr. Hayden earlier. It makes it easy to dip in and dip out. To give one example from the window size prints, and I realize you can't see her quite yet, but Sharon Farmer's Beatrice Ferguson is on the wall behind me. And Beatrice is demonstrating her skillful hula hoop technique at age 97. I understand she had apparently had a fall from her bicycle or a sore hip, otherwise she would have had another, uh, another skill. So from this picture, I enjoyed uh, a sense of pleasure, uh, wonderful to meet Beatrice, even through a picture, but also sheer encouragement to keep going. You don't have to know that she's 97 to realize that this hula hooping is a good way to go. Chronologically, there's a full sweep of photography from the early years of daguerreotypes up to contemporary times and digital images. In fact, the photo from 1839 is actually the world's oldest surviving portrait photo. In the entire world, the library has that great treasure. 
and photography conservator Rachel Wetzel is here with us today. She's an expert in Robert Cornelius. Who do you think he took this photograph of? You already know the answer, maybe? Himself. And so this portrait of Robert Cornelius has actually come to be known the world's first selfie. Finally, what's up with that exhibition title, Not an Ostrich? Frankly, we hope it is puzzling enough in an inviting way to rouse curiosity and encourage visitors to come and explore. As Dr. Hayden mentioned, the title is also a signal that the photos offer you more than meets the eye. Look close, let the photos talk to you, start a conversation. Because if it's not an ostrich, what might it be? As it turns out, I'll give you the answer for that one. <laughs> uh, the not an ostrich is a blue-eyed goose of the breed called Sebastopol, the only curly-feathered goose, not able to fly, and apparently beloved as pets these days. So there's much to enjoy, much to reflect on, through the ver universal language of photography. My remarks have been bright and light. It's meant to be encouraging. And like Dr. Hayden, I'd also acknowledge that there are serious and horrifying pictures in this exhibit too. And I think it's from civil rights riots, from the AIDS crisis, and from wars, the Civil War, all the way up to Iraq. We also have the cat Brunhilde wearing a winged helmet perhaps an association of operatic voices with the screaming and caterwauling of cats. But there are many scenes from everyday life. And you mentioned Seabiscuit winning the prankness right behind you there. I love he's pounding right for the camera. The underdog who's going to win and beat War Admiral quite a few lengths back there. And so I hope you will take, it's, it's tried almost to say take inspiration, but please stop, let the pictures talk to you. Um, help me with a final word, Dr. Hayden. <laughs> so, yeah, enjoy, thank you. Anyway, can you imagine how exciting this is for me to be here? <laughs> I travel the country. I'm out most of the time, thousands of miles. That's my task. And so to be in this, these hallowed halls is just so exciting, I don't even know what to do with myself. It's a tremendous honor to have my images of America featured in this exhibit. Sometimes when I'm thousands and thousands of miles away from these hallowed halls, I'm caught in the moment of the scene, and that's all I can think about. Then I come home, and I see what I've captured, and I realize these images are a time capsule preserved in the most historic photographic collection on Earth and this Library of Congress. I have to pinch myself. I mean, that's incredible because I'm just little me out there doing America and then all of a sudden it's here. 42 years I've been on the road. I bet off the challenge of a lifetime to visually document every part of every state and our great nation. 
as a lasting record of these, shall we say, interesting times. Legends such as Matthew Brady, who recorded the Civil War, Dorothea Lange, think of her haunting images of the Depression, and Edward Curtis, oh, so nicely captured our Native Americans, actually on their reservation. And my role model, Frances Benjamin Johnston, who worked a century ago, and she lived in New Orleans. Ah, they all left us priceless visual records of their eras of history, of our history. And you know, it's interesting because sometimes you just don't realize you, we're going through history. You think, well, that's a common scene. I see it every day. But as time moves on, it might not be so common. Throughout these 42 years that my husband, Ted Lanfair, and I have traveled the back roads and urban neighborhoods and rural valleys and the stunning parks of our land, six to eight and tens of thousands of miles each year, there are three words that we live by as almost our Bible for the ages. Because you see, if I was just doing these and keeping them in my, you know, file cabinet, so what? But they're here and they'll be here, who knows? You know, I tell grandmothers when I'm photographing them and their little baby children, you know, the grandchildren, that child will be 90 years old and they'll still be looking up this photograph. But how about 5,000 years from now? Could be, I don't know. I believe that my images are useful now. I have a lot of people who write and say, gee whiz, can I use this or use that? Absolutely you can, that's the point, isn't it? But I'm inspired every single day to know that my photographs will be a timestamp of these days and our America and our people. Every image freely available and copyright free and it's so easy because they're in the Library of Congress, they're downloadable in four different sizes. Oh, <sighs> so for the ages, that's what we're all about. Now, this five squillion, uh, I'm sorry, 15 million collection isn't just me and my images. There happen to be other, or should I say, iconic people who happen to be sitting right there that uh, are also uh, giving to this massive body of work. Sharon Falmer who is the former director of the White House photography during the Clinton administration. She was the first woman and the first African American to hold this position. That's just amazing to me. That's amazing. I mean, I do, all I have is a little teapot America exhibit. <laughs> she is also a, lo a longtime Washington DC resident and has photographed the people of our nation's capital. And she's also a doll. <laughs> You're next. <laughs> Thank you very much, because you a wild child. I heard you loud and clear. And you're totally right about history, holding on to stuff. I mean, I keep my comic books. Now, what am I going to do with them? I don't know, but I sure enough I sure enough, oh, yes, my mother said, what am I going to do with these while you're in college? I said, don't let any of my relatives touch a one, and I'll be fine. Because sometimes your relatives go, they're not going to miss this comic book. Yeah, I will. But I love photography more, and that's why I take better care of my photography gear. Comic books are in a dark place, sealed in a barrel, and I go in there and act like Queen Midas. Yeah, I got comic books. But photographs. When I look back through the years of all the wonderful things I've been able to see and do, I am just thrilled to death that my parents saw knucklehead make good, okay? Because when I was growing up, if there was a problem in the neighborhood, I was very good at coming to people's rescues. My mother was the photographer. She made clothes for us, even though she was a principal 
and my dad was a principal. I had a fit. By the time I got to the eighth grade, I said, I'm going to die. My brother says, no, if they were ministers, you could die. But they're not ministers. So just get a hold of yourself. So I enjoyed Ohio State like crazy because whole new world. It was different than Washington, D.C. Plus, I'm on my own. I got to think for myself, which means I'm taking pictures, too, because I got tired of grilling hamburgers in the student union. And I knew I could make $5, $10 off of students going, Farmer, take my picture out here on campus at Ohio State. This is a big campus. And I'm like, yes, it is. And I began to explore the campus, even though I was a bassoon major with a minor in piano and clarinet. I still play my instruments, but now it's a bass clarinet, a piano, and a bass guitar, because I want to be a funketeer, OK? <laughs> but photography is my retreat. And it's also the way to meet the rest of the people in the world that I want to meet. Every time we travel to a different country, I'd hook up with whoever the photographer was for the president or the prime minister. I learned stuff I had never dreamed of learning about. And that was a wide open education. The other thing was, I never thought it'd be fun to be a fly on the wall. But yes, it was at the White House. <laughs> yes, it was at the meetings. Yes, it was at the United Nations. Nelson Mandela, I could have died and gone to heaven right there. Because it's one thing to read about people, hear about people, they're in the news. It's another thing to meet them and go, whoa, whoa, you are bad. And when you can tell people they're bad and then you can explain it, you know education never stops. And no matter how old we all get, what's hip now may not be hip later. Anybody that's got a phone in there and their hand got that camera, you better use it. You can be a historian too. How's your neighborhood looking now compared to what it looked like when you were growing up? The good thing about being in DC, this is still a small town. Whatever you do in Southeast will be known in Northwest before midnight. So you have to watch your P's and Q's and it's really cool to be nice to everybody. Or oh, they'll say, you took their picture but you didn't take mine. Come on over here so I can get yours too. I believe in even treatment for everybody. That's photography. Photography is democratic to the max. It's freedom loving too. And unless people like Ruth, no, it's not Ruth, Rachel, saves stuff, you can't see it later. So I'm inviting Rachel to come up because she makes sure the stuff gets persevered, saved, I will say coddled, okay? Photography is coddled here. I've been to some other places. Photography is way an afterthought. Where's your photography in your wonderful museum here? I'm not sure. Oh, you have an idea? Is it somewhere in, in that direction? Is that the older stuff? Yes, sir, that's the older stuff. It's probably over there. Okay. So I learned that everybody did not appreciate photography as much as I do. But I do because I keep up with my friends. I keep up with my family. Photography shows us why we should get along. Because as time goes on, we keep finding new reasons to have a fight. Ridiculous. Photography says we're all human beings. We all want peace and quiet, except when the kids are around. But we want what we want. And if we don't have history, we cannot live together in the correct way. Is there a correct way? Yes. Peace, justice, and soul. Thank you. Come on, Rachel. Rachel, Rachel. Well, it's going to be hard to follow that up. <laughs> I'm here to talk about one particular photograph in this exhibition today, which, you know, it seems so, uh, so much of a challenge considering there are 400 other million, I mean, 400 other photographs in here that are really amazing. But uh, I'm here to talk about the Robert Cornelius Daguerreotype, which Helena mentioned earlier. And it, rece it does receive a lot of attention as being the first selfie. Um, and while it's, it's, to me, it's fascinating to think that something that was taken in 1839 would still be relevant today in 2020. Uh, but if you think about the Cornelia self-portrait, what he achieved in taking this likeness of himself, which is far more difficult than what we're doing with pointing our camera at our face and pushing a button. So everybody, and you mentioned, everybody is a photographer today because you have a camera phone. Uh, but in 1839, only a handful of people had a camera because you had to make them yourself. So Robert Cornelius made his from a tin box and an opera lens. So the photography was announced in 1839 in France, and the daguerreotype process was the first 
uh, commercially available photographic process, but it had very long exposure times of 10 to 20 minutes. So it wasn't a viable medium for portraiture. But still Cornelius tried and he sat very still in front of his camera for over 10 minutes and he was able to achieve his first selfie. Uh, but unlike us, where we can look at our camera and see our face, pose ourselves perfectly, Cornelius didn't have this option. So you'll notice when you look at the portrait, which is on the first wall and also on this window, that he's slightly off center from, his, um, from the middle of the plate. Um, but he worked alone making the self-portrait. So if you think about it in 1839, the fact that this daguerreotype is even in focus is really remarkable. Uh, but I think for me, what's most impressive is this daguerreotype plate is perfectly exposed. Um, so you know when we're taking a selfie, we take several of them, we edit them, and then we post the perfect one on, on social media. But Cornelius didn't have that option. <laughs> he had one shot, and it was one very long shot where he sat for several minutes, but he still was able to capture the like, most handsome likeness of himself. Um, so I might ask you to call the Robert Cornelius a self-portrait for its technical merit, but I have to agree that Robert Cornelius was probably the master of the selfie. <laughs> so the library recently acquired 165 items that belong to Robert Cornelius from Sarah Bodine, who is his great-great-granddaughter. And I met Ms. Bodine through my previous employer uh, because I've been researching and writing and lecturing about Robert Cornelius since 2015 um, in various aspects of photo history and through art conservation studies through a grant through the National Endowment for the Humanities. And this was before I came on board at the library in 2019. Just before the pandemic hit, I was able to meet with Ms. Bodine and see what she had in her collection and immediately upon seeing these materials, I knew they had to come to the library because they not only represent Robert Cornelius as a photographer, but they also include materials from his a family business, which was Cornelius and Baker, and they were the largest manufacturer of gas lamps and chandeliers in the United States uh, in the 19th century. And some of those chandeliers still hang in the US Capitol across the street. Um, so with the help of curator Micah Messenheimer, I was able to transfer Ms. Bodine's collection to the library very recently. And that collection includes a Robert Cornelius daguerreotype, several other daguerreotypes and case images of his children, a tin box that contains a whole bunch of experimental camera lenses, seven of his patent submissions, which have beautiful hand watercolor drawings made by him, and boxes of his personal ephemera. So now the library owns the largest collection of Robert Cornelius' daguerreotypes, including the iconic self-portrait, and the only collection of his personal materials. And I'm also currently writing a book for the library on him, which will feature Ms. Bodine's donation and um, items from the Marion S. Carson collection, which we received in the 90s. And, and um, one more note is for the preservation aspect. Uh, there's been a focused effort between Micah and myself uh, through the conservation and prints and photographs to stabilize, assess, survey, and house and preserve every single daguerreotype, which is just a little under a thousand, which is one of the largest collections in America. And we're doing this to make, uh, make it more accessible for researchers in the future. And um, because these are the earliest photographic uh, records that we hold here at the library. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you for everyone for joining us. Um, so what comes next? There's a really wonderful film that was made as a sort of centerpiece of this exhibition about America's library and how we collect photographs. So I'm gonna invite you to sit. We're gonna turn on the film. Feel free to enjoy the film. Um, it runs about 30 minutes total. Or if you're ready to get up and explore the exhibition, you're welcome to do that too. So we'd invite you to take a look around. Um, if you'd like to do any interviews with any of the folks who have spoken, I'm happy to connect you with them. My name is Brett Zonker from the Library of Congress, and we're so happy you joined us today, so thank you.